Thanks for tuning in to the World XP Podcast. If you're enjoying the content, please drop us up, drop a like, and let us know your thoughts below in the comments. Also, please consider supporting our podcast via the link below. It really helps us out. Logan, welcome to the World XP Podcast. How you doing, man? Good, man. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. So, um, Logan and I met very randomly playing in a soccer tournament called TST. And this conversation probably will have zero soccer in it. Well, maybe some. I'm sure we'll touch on some stuff. Um, but we were chatting at the tournament, and I found out that he's big into uh, blockchain and Web3 and crypto. Uh, I was like, I haven't had one of those guys on yet. And I've heard all the terms and have no idea about any of it. So I was like, let's get him on. And here you are. Yeah, here I am. Thanks for having me on, man. I'm excited to chat. We'll see what we we get up to here. For sure. So to start things off, why don't you give a little intro about like basically who you are and what you do? Yeah, definitely. Um, Let's see. So I am currently an entrepreneur in the blockchain space. Um, So let's see, about two years ago, I graduated from Stanford University. I played soccer professional soccer for about six months before I stopped uh, early retirement, I suppose, to dive full into my startup. And and that's what I've been doing for the past kind of two years here. So what made, so what, what was your degree in at Stanford? How did you jump into the blockchain space? What piqued your interest in something that if you ask somebody random on the street who has no idea, they'd be like, oh, it's a scam. All I know is Sam Bankman fried uh, and for those listening who don't know who that is, he stole a bunch of money and tricked Tom Brady and somebody else. I don't know. But um, what piqued the interest? And in, and you were like, okay, I'm going to put my entire livelihood into this thing that other mo- a lot of people would say is just not real, not going to stick around, a fad, all these things. Yeah. Um, I think a, a real differentiator for me is is knowing the difference between blockchain and crypto. Um so my story started, I don't know what year it was. I think it was shortly before COVID hit, but I was in this science and technology policy class. Um, and we were pretty much looking at, you know, potentially writing a, a paper about a, a policy proposal for our final project. And me and one of my buddies, um, it was about the same time when it was kind of the bull market, Bitcoin was picking up steam, uh, Ethereum. I started to hear a lot of it about it, started to dig into smart contracts. And I was like, oh, this is cool technology. Um, So pretty much I wrote a paper about how health data collected by hospitals should be anonymized and stored in a decentralized system. So on a blockchain so that everyone can have access to it. AI algorithms can all have this huge pool of data to to innovate off of. Um, The idea behind this was like, okay, imagine you have every MRI of an ACL in one database. Imagine how much patterns that these, you know, these AI algorithms could recognize that that humans can't. Um, so the bigger the data set, the better, especially if, if it's all legitimate data. Um, so that's how I originally got into it. Um, really, you know, I, was, I, was, I bought some Ethereum, I bought some Bitcoin, um, I started researching different kind of layer one protocols. Um, and yeah, I, I I fell in love with with the technology because one thing that was happening at the time was our presidential elections. And I was like, there's half of our country that doesn't even believe the results of the election. I mean, whether you agree with that or not, we can't confirm, right? So why don't we vote on top of a blockchain system where you can verify votes, where it's completely transparent. If you cast your vote, you can see that it's counted. Um, So I was like, okay, well, this is something that that will logically happen. if, if democracy is to persist. Um, and I just think that with blockchains, it's all about transparency. And that's really the bottom line of why I love the technologies because look, if you look at Bitcoin, you can go back all the way to when it was invented in, in 2008 and you can see every transaction that ever happened. So if you want, if you want a, a system where everything is transparent, whether it's votes, whether it's sending assets to people, um, or, or, or digital identities, things like that. I, I think blockchain is a really exciting technology to innovate transparency and in there about after, once you introduce transparency into a system, you get rid of more corruption. So that's how I got into the space. I think it's uh, that blockchain is going to find its way into pretty much every industry in some way, shape or form in the next five to 10 years here. So 
just kind of riding the wave. It's tough times right now with uh, the regulation and, and skepticism of the industry. Um, but I think uh, that the technology would prevail. But yeah, that's how I got into it. Fair enough. So if you were to give a like 30 second definition of blockchain for dummies, how would you describe it, define it? So I would just say it's a different type of database. So instead of you having all of your information held with Google or held with Facebook or held with Apple, you own it yourself. So in, you you have your, I mean, people call them crypto wallets. You could call them a lot of different things. But in this in this new thing that, that you own, you can hold your identity. You can hold your assets um, and you can kind of be your own bank. So instead of a, a centralized database, it's a decentralized database um, and it's, Instead of having, you know, a few people at the top that control it and they can kick you off the platform if they want. It's a it's a way where you can have kind of self-sovereign ownership and, and self-sovereign identity. Um, so I'm going to simplify that and say it's a new type of database where no one controls it. So it's it's kind of a different way of thinking about um, about technological advancement, in my opinion. But yeah, I think it's just an innovation and in, in how how information can be confirmed uh, through a different type of database that that no one controls. I know I, I asked you this when we were in North Carolina, but the part that I don't get still is how no one controls it. So if you right, if you're creating something, if you're creating something on like within like how is a blockchain made? Like somebody has to create the blockchain. So mm -hmm. why do how do they not control it then? So it, it depends on how decentralized the blockchain is, but have you heard of the terms like proof of stake? Yeah, but I don't, I don't really, yeah, I have. I don't really know what they mean okay, exactly. So these are, those are different consist, consensus mechanisms. So those are the different ways that blockchains can confirm that the transactions coming to the chain are true. So pretty much in Bitcoin's world, how it works is you pretty much have a bunch of different places around the world that are racing to solve a math problem in order to confirm the blockchain is secure and it's being recorded properly. So if you saw, if your big computer system solves that math problem fastest, you get rewarded by the network. And then let's say Cardano's case. In Cardano's case, there's 3000 different stake pool operators. So what you do is you're able to lend your Cardano to these stake pools and this gives them more power to confirm transactions on the network. And if they confirm transactions, then they get rewarded by the underlying protocol. So there's no one entity that's turning the system on and off. I think with Solana, you have you have a bit of that, um, which is one of my pet peeves with, with Solana, uh, claiming to be decentralized. But yeah, it's it's really it's a dispersed computer network where all the computers are working together in order to confirm transactions. What's proof of work and proof of stake for those listening? Or what's the, like, if you were to define those? Yeah, I'm not like a huge expert on this, but in terms of, of layman's terms, proof of work is when you have to prove you've done the work in order to confirm a transaction. So it's like a computer solving a complex math problem to ensure that the blockchain is recording transactions correctly. Proof of stake is when there's different pools of stake or the token in these different pools um, in order for the um, the network to come to consensus. It's pretty complicated. It's not really my bread and butter, but overall what they are, are different types of consens decentralized consensus, consensus mechanisms um, so that the blockchain can come to consensus about what is going on the chain and what is true. So essentially just the entire computer network is regulating itself. Is that something that so I'm, I'm, when you are creating or because blockchain is, so, is software, correct? So, is software. Yeah. So when you code the software, is it being coded in such a way that it's like once this, once I click go or publish or whatever, the only way that something can work is if it receives just per example's sake, if it receives consensus from these six computers. Is like that is that how it's coded into into the software? 
it depends. In, in, a, in a very simplified example. Yeah. So you you submit a transaction. The transaction goes to the blockchain, and or it, it goes to before it gets to the blockchain, it goes through the consensus mechanisms, and then it goes to the chain. Um, so I would say that's a simplified version. Um, but I do want to take a step back and say I am not a technical expert, but I do I do live and breathe the space, so I know a good bit about it. Sure. Gotcha. Okay, so let's jump maybe and say, what's Web3? Oh, Web3. All right, so Web2 is owned by Facebook. It's owned by Google. It's owned by Apple. It's owned by these big tech companies. Because pretty much everything, Amazon, everything, in order to make a Web2 application, you're going to spin up a, an Amazon server so that you can have a database to own your information. Um, and Web3, instead of a corporation owning your information, you own your own information. So instead of logging in with your email and password, you log in by connecting your crypto wallet. Um, so you'll see when you interact with blockchain applications or Web3 applications, they don't normally ask for a, a, an email or username. They might for marketing purposes so they can hit you with an email and a newsletter and whatnot. But really, when you transact on their website, it's through your wallet. Um, so really, the different what Web3 is, it's a new era of the internet where the users of the internet actually own their own information. Hmm. All this is very interesting to me because I, you probably know this, but when people say, oh, I bought Apple in 1997 or whatever, and then I sold it or all these things, you kind of want to, you try and take the lessons from the past and translate it into your own into your own life. And you're like, I'm not going to be that guy that had Apple in 97 and is like, oh God, I shouldn't have sold it, right? And so I'm trying to understand, but I think people had the same or similar issues with the internet back then that they are with this new iteration of blockchain, Web3, et cetera. And I, I, re, I read as much as I can about it. And it's still very foreign. Like the concepts are, are foreign if you don't live and breathe it because you're so used to it being in one way. Mm -hmm. Um is it, do you have an example of like a, a common Web3 application that people would just know or, or would have heard of? OpenSea. It's where you buy NFTs. Um, I think Web3 is going to be a lot more than that. But I'm trying to think. I might just put, I might just go back to what you said of like, you know, you someone bought Apple in 1997. I think we're we're somewhat in a similar time period. Like you had the dot com crash, right? Mm -hmm. There was times in history when people thought the internet was, you know, I, I remember watching like some clip where where Jay Jay Leno was talking like Bill Gates or something, and Jay Leno was like, "Why would I ever go to a website to read the news when I can just get a newspaper?" <laughs> it's like uh, like because it's way faster and easier, and it's like commonplace now. Um, and now I think it's similar. Like, why would I ever? open a, a crypto wallet and pretty soon there's going to be all types of companies where you need to get their token in order to interact with their products and maybe it gives you access to um musicians because musicians get ripped off by spotify and apple music they barely get any any royalties uh, they get cents for you know they get a million streams and it's still not that big of a deal in terms of money making but with web3 you cut out the middleman there's no longer that centralized entity that's that's the the in between between the listener of the music and the artist. Um, I think there's products projects like Audius. I think it's a pretty cool one um, in terms of of Web three music. Um, but in terms of common app applications that are on Web three right now, I think one is decentralized exchanges. So these are when so say you have some Cardano or some Ethereum in your wallet and you want to trade this for a different token, this is when you would go to a decentralized exchange and you can swap the token for a different token. Um, and then there's all sorts of different like lending and borrowing protocols. So you can lend your assets to a smart contract. The smart contract makes, you know, 5% um, without fail. And then it sends it back to you once, you, once you've kind of done your loan there um, or your lending there. And yeah, I think... Right now we're we're in the infancy of 
realizing real world use cases for blockchain. I think that's a that's a big challenge for for my company particularly. It's like we have this application and we're trying to figure out where's the barrier to entry low enough so that we can apply it to the real world because that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in in real businesses operating on blockchain technology which causes them to be more transparent. Um so yeah, I mean I'll I'll pause there. I feel like I'm kind of rambling on. No, you're good. Ramble away. Um but I think to go back to the 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 buying Apple stock in 97 analogy somebody there's people who bought Apple stock cuz their friend told them to not understanding what it was. And I feel like that's a lot of people with crypto now. And I try to not I try to not do that as a general like if I'm going to buy something, I try to have at least kind of an understanding of of what it is but to your point about real world application i think we're in such the infancy stage of it even though bitcoin is what 15 years old now even though even though bitcoin is 15 years old we're still the adaptation by the general public is taking time so for me to get a crypto wallet it's like i should and everyone who understands it is like you should definitely do this but yeah. then nobody like has no utility other than just holding that crypto now so it's hard to it's hard to wrap it's hard for people who aren't in the space to wrap their head around like hey yeah you should do this because eventually um all your favorite artists are going to be accepting only crypto and you're going to need to put in to pay with a token <laughs> right like that that world doesn't exist yet and it's hard for people to say well why would i this it's the same thing that jay leno said why would I read news on online when I can just get a newspaper? It's like, well, why would I pay for music with a token when I can just go to Spotify? But eventually that change is going to happen. I think we're still so early. Yeah. I don't know. For for the for the general public, I think we're still oh, so absolutely. early that it's like it's weird. So I don't what and cuz I feel like also just listening to you talk in your head the real world applications are just everywhere. You could you could go to any business and make a pitch for like this is how you would use this. But it's yeah. just getting people on board is the hard part. Well, the the hard part is the technical barrier to entry at this point. What do you um, mean? Also, what, what do you mean by that? So if you want to use so so what my company does, what we do is we pretty much build corporate governance or community governance on the blockchain. So you can use our application to create an organization that's run by smart contracts. And before I go into it, really all that smart contracts are is they're just code that behaves exactly how you want it to every time. So instead of having a long legal contract where there's things that are kind of black and white or like, you know, in the gray area. And if, if course, someone that's, that's how lawyers live. Yeah, exactly. That's how lawyers live. Um, it's, it's a black and white contract. So in our example, we let people create blockchain-based organizations. So you can come to our platform and you can say, hey, this is the identifier of our governance token. This is how much of the governance token must vote for a proposal for it to move funds from our, our treasury to a different wallet address. Uh, this is how much of the governance token you have to hold in your wallet in order to have the power to create a proposal in our organization. This is how much governance token you need to have in your wallet in order to actually cast a vote in our organization. Um, so then you, you can put all of that on chain. So then you have this treasury and these governance rules surrounding this treasury. So when people purchase this token, they know exactly how this protocol works. They know exactly how decisions are made with these funds. Um, so, you know, it's, so now that's, that's like, what what we do. Okay, so you could use this for nonprofits. If a nonprofit wants to start a DAO, a DAO, pretty much what we do is a DAO. It's, it stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So say a company, a, a nonprofit wants to start a, a decentralized autonomous organization so that people who donate to them also get ownership in, in deciding how the funds are used. Or it could be, you know, a, a sports team that wants to give, you know, $50,000 a year in the hands of their community so they can vote on okay let's use this to donate to a local charity let's use this to you know hire this entertainment for halftime um you know it's anything so there, there's there's tons of different use cases um for this type of stuff but really the perfect use case for a DAO is a local government 
So you have all these funds that, you know, they're supposed to be used of, by, and for the people, right? So what, what you could do is have a decentralized organ, autonomous organization say, okay, every quarter we're going to let, you know, the people choose how our funds are allocated. Um, and there are certain things that, you know, maybe and it's like, we want to spend a million dollars to improve the the road system in our county, or we want to have, I don't know, different scholarships. I, I don't know what it would be, but there's, there's a ton of different use cases that you could imagine for the technology, but it's like, who are going to be the early adopters? Why do they want it now? What burning need is it solving? Um, and I think the other biggest difficulty with um, crypto right now is just, and, and blockchain in general is, is regulation. The SEC is, is kind of regulating by enforcement right now. So they're going after Binance, they're suing Coinbase. Um, and all these companies are saying is like, hey, or especially Coinbase, in my opinion, they're saying, hey, we just want legal clarity. Like we will listen, we will be compliant, but this is a new asset class. The, the regulations need to be you know, updated uh, to reflect this. Um, but yeah, circling all the way back, I think I think the big hindrances to kind of blockchain adoption right now are the technical barrier to entry, uh, which is you have to download a wallet, you have to understand how to get crypto in that wallet, you have to like understand what you can use your crypto assets for, um, and education is a big one. I think that goes along with the technical barrier to entry, and then also just unclear regulation surrounding the industry. Um, I think there's a lot of people that that kind of think like I do in terms of, okay, this is a technology that should be used for, you know, national elections. This is a technology that that should be used to autonomous, autonomously, you know, ensure that nonprofits are spending money for what they, they say they're going to spend. I mean, you look at the the Black Lives Matter campaign, they raised a ton of money and like not much of it went to the cause that they they were were running on right no i think Um, the founders bought like three mansions or something and yeah yeah and there's they're sending it to their 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 brothers and sisters and it's like with a with a DAO that wouldn't happen if you had all those people that donated to that cause collectively deciding you know how we actually attack this issue you wouldn't have a few bad actors and that's exactly what sam bankman fried and ftx was it wasn't the the crypto or the blockchain part of it it was these centralized actors that were taking money, giving money to, to political parties, using this money to get stadium rights and all this stuff. And they just had, it was, it was the centralized points that, that failed, not the decentralized points. So yeah, there's, there's a lot to talk about and unpack, man. I, I don't know. I don't know how I got to that point, but. No, um, it's fine. I want to talk about the, the SEC for a bit because, so I didn't know that they were suing Coinbase. And for full full disclosure, I use Coinbase because when I was looking at different various things, I was like, FTX, nah, I don't know. Like, it just seemed weird. Like, a 30-year-old guy was living in the Bahamas with, like, a bunch of his friends. And I was like, nah, not them. And then Binance Binance was, like, interfacing with them. And I was like, nah, not them either. And I was like, all right, Coinbase seems the most reasonable. Like, I'll use them. So what what is, are they, if the SEC is suing them, is it for, like, for, or what's the situation there? So really, what I understand is that they're suing them for being um, selling unregistered securities. Okay, so my perspective on this is that Coinbase has taken in so many different applications for tokens to launch on their platform, and they've denied ninety percent of them. And so they they've denied ninety. 90% of them. So not just any any token is listed on Coinbase. So Coinbase has been very careful. Coinbase has met with the SEC like 30 times in the last few years to try to get regulatory clarity. Um, and it hasn't come. And then all of a sudden they get hit with a lawsuit um, saying, hey, you've been selling unregistered security. So really the whole lawsuit, which will unfold in the next few years here is what uh, like are are what makes something a security and what makes something a commodity? So you know you've you've probably heard of the the Howey test. Um, that's that was made. I don't even know what year, but a long time ago. So I think what will result in this is because crypto are this new asset class, and something can start as a security and then become not a security over time because at first yes it may be held by a few different people. Um, 
And then over time, it becomes like this decentralized currency that a ton of different people use, and it's no longer a security anymore. So there's going to be, there was legislation introduced about that, actually. Um, if, a, if an asset can start as a security, then become a commodity. But yeah, it's, it's, it's the Wild West right now in terms of defining w what a crypto asset is and what characteristics of an asset make it a security or not. Because... While, you know, you have company stock, you can compare it to, to tokens. Tokens can also do a lot of other things. You can use them for governance. You can use them to give rewards. You can use them for loyalty programs. You can use them for, for a ton of different things. So it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out. That's quite interesting. That's the, well, it makes total sense why the government is wanting to get involved because it's something that they don't really have their fingers in, in the pie of as of as of now yeah, the um thing, it's it's uh the thing with with blockchain and crypto is it it's uh instead of everything kind of being under the government's umbrella this is completely outside um of their umbrella so it's changing the way money works and they like the way money works because they control it right so um we'll see we'll see how it goes yeah i wonder what that's gonna do economically for fiat currency right now because Obviously, in 71, Nixon took us off the gold standard, and then the inflation has been pretty yeah. bad since then. And if you want to listen to a real economist, don't listen to me. Um, <laughs> but our monetary policy has not gone well, to say the least. And so now we've got this new thing that's popping up. And it's also interesting, you can draw a parallel with the news as well. Um, nobody's using, nobody has to go on Fox or CNN anymore. They can just put a show on YouTube. Tucker Carlson leaves Fox or they, however, however that worked, he's no longer at Fox. And then his, he put a show on Twitter and that show did better than all of the cable news combined that day. And it's like, all right, so nobody needs these. Like the, the big players from 20, 30 years ago, aren't like the middlemen, like you were saying are not needed anymore. And I think, I don't know, it just seems like we're in a big era of transition in a lot of different ways. And I'm not sure how people are handling it generally. As change is hard generally, but I don't know. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think to, to keep flowing off your flow, um, right now, think about how much... All right, I, I'll step back. There's something called some Moore's Law that I, I believe in. It's pretty much a law that says that technolog technological innovation will increase exponentially. Like, dude, the internet, in terms of the grand scheme of things, like me and you talking on a video call, like just like a normal thing, mm -hmm. that's like, what? I don't even know. 20 years old, the internet, like the popular internet, yeah. in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Like things are going to, start changing fast and they will never change slower again. Like AI, the, the, the stuff you can do with AI right now, the amount of new technologies that come out. Like I was just sitting at a dinner and this the, the other night and this guy is making like an autonomous agent to do home inspections. Like there's, there's so many different innovations happening and you probably hear about so little of them. But like the way the world works is just going to continuously change and change at a rapid rate because technology is only going to build on top of technology and you'll, you'll start to get this exponential curve of like having having technological progress. So I do think we're in a, a very big, um, a very big transition period. But to jump back to what what you were saying about, you know, you don't need the middleman because, you know, Tucker Carlson is now on Twitter and I guess you know, Twitter is, is the wild west for media, I'd say, because, you know, no one's getting silenced on it. Um, well, the first web two, oftentimes what people call it is the internet of information. So instead of information coming from mail or magazines or these, these physical newspaper sources, you now have this worldwide web where information is just readily available for anyone with Wi-Fi. Um, and now web three, 
what they're calling that is the internet of value. Okay. So now instead of being in these siloed systems with, with banks um, and, and government agencies, you're going to have this internet where you can own your own identity. You can confirm that you're a citizen of a nation. You can confirm how old you are with credentials in your decentralized wallet. So say you go, you know, and, and you can also hold your own assets and send them to someone in Africa in a matter of seconds. You, you no longer have to have these cross border payments because now you have this distributed internet where you can send value. So before we had this distributed internet where you could send information, what blockchain brings into play is you have a distributed internet where you can send value. Um, so I think that's that's the main main thing with Web3 is it's no longer just you, you're like you, you've always been able to send an email to anyone in the world. Now you can send assets to anyone in the world without having to ask ask permission. Um, so it's going to be pretty, pretty crazy. But yeah, dude, I agree. I mean, we are in a state of flux. Like I think our like the the cultural dynamics in in the states right now i think you have like these the, the two party system i feel like is just so counterproductive in a lot of ways and i think regulation is is just going to continue to fall behind uh technology unless you know technology starts making regulation somehow um, well yeah. it already is behind if we're being totally honest um One. like you like for those listening go google um who is it? The CEO of Google and uh, his testimony in front of Congress. Oh, like was that the one or was it Zuckerberg? I don't know. Google one of the Google one of the two, but it's like the guys asking him how the internet works, and it's like, dude, you are in the Senate or Congress or whatever, and you don't. Um, it's frankly just embarrassing. But what one of the interesting points about being able to transfer an asset borderlessly is what like the thought that I had was I don't I wonder if we're going to see the collapse of governments as we know them from the standpoint of governments basically for for the most part control currency military like national defense and then infrastructure essentially and a f few other things if you take away and they get that money through taxes essentially is all obviously simplified but if you take away if everyone owns their own thing and it's almost kind of like bank collapse proof, essentially, if they if everyone is owning their own stuff and they can send the money to wherever they want, and I wonder how tax collection is going to be, and then if governments cannot can no longer find ways to raise funds to maybe fix the road or any of the like down the road, like what are we looking at? It's kind of it's a bit worrisome i'd say because i don't know if people will adapt that quickly you, like do you know what i'm getting at it's like we're I looking did. at this weird like maybe some guy in the u.s doesn't like the u.s and he's like you know what i'm just gonna send a gazillion dollars worth of bitcoin to some guy in russia or some guy wherever like there's no not that governments are a good thing generally but like we're gonna be looking at the whims of people who happen to have more of these things being able to have much more influence than maybe otherwise they would. Yeah. I think, um, I think governments are a good thing. I think that governments provide immense value. I mean, like taking care of infrastructure, like imagine trying to drive around with, with a bunch of potholes in the road or sure. not sure whether the bridge is going to stand up or, you know, having people construct skyscrapers without like having the right oversight on what materials they're using. Like there is definitely things that, I mean, are, are typically the government's job. Um, and I think that's just kind of the, the way that we've always thought is like, there always has to be this top down organization that organizes everything. Um, but, but what I believe in and what makes it a little less scary for me is I believe in, in localized governments. I think that governments should be small. You should have, you know, Palm Beach County, wh wherever you live, like it should be a robust government where, you know, you no longer have this, you know, huge 
organization at the top who who's trying to track the taxes for 300 million people having to hire hundreds of thousands of IRS agents, it should be a smaller government where it's like, okay, we're going to take care of our county because this is the place we live. We're actually going to care about our elections. Um, participation will go up because, you know, we're responsible for our county. And, you know, there there is larger scale projects that will take coordination. So I don't know exactly what the future holds, but I do believe in, in localized governments and, and, you know, federation of, of power and, and all that stuff. I think um, it just gets too complicated to try to govern a, a massive nation with, with, you know, millions, in some cases, billions of people properly. So I believe in, I believe in localized governments a, a lot. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I totally agree. And, and to the point of the U S so many different cultures here, it's easier when you're in Europe and everybody has kind of come from the same culture and, and it's a little bit easier in, in that aspect. But yeah, this people, people can't even like, I struggle to coach a team of 15, 16 year olds. How is somebody going to govern like 330 million people? Like it is, it doesn't work, but yeah, the local, the localized government hundred percent is where, because those are the things that affect the people on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Like for the most part, presidential election doesn't really affect affect us. Well, maybe this time cuz gas prices are super high and groceries are expensive. But like generally generally like Bill Burr had a he went on Conan. He was like people are all up in arms and he was like what was when uh when Trump got elected the first time and he was like what was Obama calling you to make you a sandwich every day? He's like you're going to be fine. Like generally that's kind of what it is. So yeah, I don't know. I think I hope that's the case. I hope things go more uh local. I don't know. Would you call yourself a libertarian? I like kind freedom. of freedom. Fair enough. That's a I good like answer. Freedom. I don't I don't really know <laughs> what I am politically that's, to be that's, honest. That's... I, I think a lot of people are like that too. I hate yeah. I hate how people think they have to pick a side. Like, dude. And also I I if we have to vote between Biden and Trump, I'm just like, dude, we are we are supposed to be the best nation in the world, right? And we're about to vote between grandpa one and grandpa two, both of which probably very corrupt. I don't know, man. It, I just it worries me what's going on up up in our federal government, and I'm like, oh. But yeah, I mean, I I am an optimist. I I always will be. I think there are more good people than bad people, um, and I do think that, you know, there's there's a lot left for for humans to figure out, and and we're figuring it out pretty fast. So hundred um, percent, like UFOs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, all right, let's go off the depressing stuff. How did you start? Is it how many people does your company have? Is it just you? You got you. You have a couple people. How did you start it? What what was the what was the kickstart for? Instead of trying to work for some some other company that's doing blockchain, you're like, no, I'm doing my own my own thing. What was the kickstart for that? Also, by the way, the picture you sent me, and I saw this on your um Instagram. I think you were speaking at some conference recent yeah. recently ish. How was that? That was cool. Uh, so first off, I'll give a shout out to my co-founder, Justin. Uh, so we were actually good fin- friends growing up. Um, we didn't go to the same university or anything, but but growing up, we always talked business ideas and whatnot. And around our senior year, um, we came back for the holidays uh, in, in St. Louis, where we're both from. Um, kind of started working on it part time. And then I was like, dude, I'm going all in. Um, and he did the same. He, he uh never showed up for his uh, job at Deloitte. We dove into it. And now we have uh, three full-time developers um, and then me and Justin as well. So um, that's the team. And yeah, that that video you're talking about. So that was a three-minute pitch I did um, at the Google headquarters in Zurich um, for an accelerator program that, that we were in about a year ago. Um, but yeah, that was, that was definitely a cool experience to be able to to talk on a stage like that. What is it like managing or hiring people for something that, for something like that? Like it has to fit the vision, has to fit the, the culture, right? When, when 
you're a startup you have to have people that are bought in fully otherwise it doesn't you can't have somebody that's just like oh i just want paycheck it doesn't work like that yeah yeah i think i mean the first thing you got to think about is are they a culture fit um but you also have to think about what their technical skills are because for me like i want to build this crazy blockchain application but i don't code so it's like all right i need people that can code right so um you know, you have your your technical evaluations. Uh, we were lucky enough to be able to partner with a company called Imlabs. Um, they're a blockchain consultancy. Um, so we get, you know, one of our lead engineers from them, actually. Um, and he's been, you know, he's actually, he's younger than me, but he's an absolute wizard um, um, coding. So he's kind of our main smart contract developer. And then, um, yeah, I mean, finding people, Generally, if you're a blockchain developer, you have kind of the ideology of like, yeah, blockchain should replace a lot of existing systems and there's a lot to be built on top of the technology. Um, so yeah, I think finding a culture fit um, is is difficult because oftentimes when you're finding engineers that come from all over the world, there's a time difference, there's a language barrier. Sometimes English isn't their first language, but that's just how blockchain is, man. It's a global movement, uh, I think. Um, so, yeah. How does it feel to be on, I would say you're on the ground floor, you think? Maybe maybe floor one, I don't know. <laughs> how how does it, if the, do you ever think about the future and if it takes off blockchain and kind of what that'll mean for you and being an early adopter of something like this that can have such a like like you and i i'm I, what like a year or two older than you i think um so it's not like being in our mid mid 20s and then thinking about being involved in something that could potentially have such an impact do, do you ever think about that or not really are you just going along and being like you know what i like blockchain it's a cool thing or you go to your head hits the pillow and you're like, I could be amazing. Um, I mean, I would say being a startup founder, it's 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 highs and lows. Um, probably more lows than highs. Um, but the you you gotta always come back to the reason you started it, the reason you took the risk. Um, because that's what entrepreneur entrepreneur means. It means a risk taker. Um, and the reason I took the risk is because I think that if we don't utilize blockchain technology, we, I'll put it this way. You see something online, do you know if it's true or not? Like how, how do nope. we verify truth? You have no idea these days. Fact right? checkers, you, man. Yeah, fact checkers. You can't even trust the fact checkers. Like who, who, who the hell is the fact checkers? But I think that, you know, with transparency, bringing about real truth, I think that blockchain is going to be so important um, in verifying information. So and sharing information correctly that, you know, that's why I originally did it. I think it's going to change the world. I think that, um, so yeah, I do. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, this could be, you know, a billion dollar protocol that we're building. Absolutely. Um, but right now we're, we're in the mud, man. We're, we're down deep. The SEC is coming after some of the big players in our industry. Um, and we're, we're, I think, as an, the industry as a whole is having to, to dig our heels in and, you know, we're going to quietly keep building and, and quietly keep uh, finding real world use for, for this stuff. So um, at, at this point, it's a, it's a perseverance thing. And, you know, the big vision is always going to be there, but you got to make the small steps forward to make the big vision happen. So that's where we're at. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel in, in your eyes? Like I remember when Bitcoin hit like 60 K or whatever, a year or two ago um and then everything started to go way 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 down and a lot of the sort of altcoins zeroed out or a few of them did um people were saying oh this is the end of crypto like eventually bitcoin will just zero out and all these things where is your name i mean name one new technology that's lasted 15 years and then just died well for sure right that's what i i didn't think it was going to but i'm saying there's yeah, people yeah. out there that are that are doing this and you've taken this huge risk 
are you sort of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel now that Bitcoin's back up? And I know obviously the SEC is doing what it's doing, but at some point, like for them, just based on what you told me about the lawsuit with uh, Coinbase, it doesn't seem like it'll like it might drag on for a while, but it doesn't seem like it'll stick because they can Coinbase can say, hey, we tried to talk to you guys and you guys gave us this answer and you guys didn't give us clarity on y- yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Like a judge has to eventually say, yeah, Coinbase, you've screwed up. But from what you've said and from what the reading I've done, it doesn't really seem like they have. Um, no. So Honestly, like, I don't even mind the SEC doing it because the only thing it means is there's going to be a resolution eventually. Like yeah. we will have legal clarity, um, hopefully in the coming years. So um, is there light at the end of the tunnel? I think, yeah, there is. Um, I think it might take a few years. Um but I, I really do think the the underlying technology and and the things it can do to preserve freedoms is is very important. And you know, maybe some bad things have to happen in order for people to realize it, which sucks. So, you know, like I think about the banking collapses. Like there's been big bank collapses and and most people don't even like bat an eye at it all. Just, you know, fifty billion dollars is disappears and then you know the the federal government is just like okay yeah no don't worry we got your deposits like this this fractional reserve banking system is is it's got cracks man and and if things start to go down you know the only safe place where you can hold your assets is going to be in a crypto wallet um so i would if you do hold your stuff on coinbase i would open like a a wallet and put it in there because then you actually hold it um but yeah, I think there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I'm not going to give up. I think that I think that it's uh, it's the next step in in kind of human progress to to be built on top of uh, a transparent system. Because right now the internet's so siloed, it's so hidden. You don't know what's true. Um, and then also the other thing is there is billions of people in this world. They can't get a bank account. Like, yes, we live in the United States. Like typically it's it's pretty easy to open a bank account, be able to make money. But like in, in a lot of different countries, they don't have good banking systems where they can go. And if they want to take a loan out, their interest rate's going to be like 90%. Like this is going to enable like the whole continent of Africa to be able to be their own banks. So I could see a situation. This is kind of a a crazy statement, but I could see a situation where, you know, Africa starts like leapfrogging the Western world because we're stuck in these legacy systems and they're on to the next. Um, yeah. Food for thought. That's interesting. Yeah, that's cool. That's an interesting thought. I'm going to think about that afterwards. <laughs> um, but no, you definitely should keep going. I admire the risk that you've taken has been as it's, it's awesome. People, that have started their own businesses and are working for themselves. It's like the first kind of step to that freedom or independence that you're talking about anyways, even within the systems that are currently, that currently exist. But um, yeah, I need to start, need to start doing that maybe at some point. Um, All right. Did you watch Champions League final? Of course. What'd you think? It wasn't straightforward, but the inevitable happened. Yeah. I mean, the city was just so good. Um, it was interesting to watch Holland cool off towards the end of the season because he was just so good on fire at the start of the season. Um, I'm like a mad Premier League fan, so I I'm interested to see how that pans out. But the final was good. I thought Inter put up a great fight. Um and we'll see if Man City is good again next year. I, I doubt they'll uh, take their foot off the gas if, if, if Pep's at the helm. Yeah, no, he will always be demanding excellence. People who are saying that the game was boring, it's like I get it, but also the how good Inter actually were defensively made it boring, and that Dude, was we're competing, bro. It yeah, was, yeah. And the the tactical switch that they made to they stayed with the three in the back, but the third center back would go into midfield to follow whether it was De Bruyne or Gundogan to to make it four on four in midfield, was like, if you are late one time on that, you get scored on, and that's they were late one time all game. And Bernardo Silva gets to the byline, and that's when Rodri scored. They were late one time, 
in 90 yep. minutes. And it's like, those are the margins, man. And then, of course, Lukaku should have tied it. But, um, and he blocked that shot. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. What are your thoughts on what are your thoughts on next year? It seems Arsenal are going after Declan Rice and maybe Caicedo and McAllister's going to Liverpool and we've got a few moving pieces going around. Harry Kane, I feel like he'll probably stay, but um because I know United pulled their interest. They're like, nah, Daniel Levy's a scumbag. We're not doing business with him. <laughs> um what oh, do you yeah. what, what do you Yeah. What do you what are you thinking about next season? How do you think things are gonna shape up? It's a good question. Um, I'm a Newcastle fan, so I'm Ooh, good year for you guys. Really good year. I mean, we're in the Champions League, so we gotta buff up the squad a bit to handle the the load. Um, I think City's gonna be up there. I think Arsenal, especially if they make the transfers for for Casado and um, and Rice, they'll definitely be up there. I don't love their nine. Like, I don't think Jesus is the answer, particularly. Yeah. Um, but I think he could also prove me wrong. Um, he, he's, he's definitely, you know, a hardworking guy that loves to get goals. So, um, and then what other Brighton, if they can keep it up, that'll be interesting. Does there be there? I don't know. I love <laughs> Unai Emery at Aston Villa is another interesting one. Those, those guys will be, we'll see how good, if they can continue the rhythm as well. I think there's a lot that could happen. Chelsea's Chelsea's season next year will be very interesting. Maybe they'll uh, get relegated. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Oh uh, no, they, they won't. They won't. It'll be interesting they won't. to see if they actually bounce back in a big way or not. Because they got some talent. They just got to put it together somehow. And now they got Pochettino, so that should be a, a step up. You know what's really interesting about the Premier League going into next year is with how good Brighton have been. Newcastle, obviously, in the top four. Aston Villa finished what seventh or something like that. Mm-hmm. You have like eight or ten teams that you could be like they could all challenge for Europe, and yeah. that's going to make for a really interesting season. I wonder. I wonder if like two through nine will kill each other and all finish on like fifty five points, and City will just have ninety, and it'll be a season like that or something like that, or if or if it'll be close the whole way. But there's more teams now. It used to just be like big five or six, and now oh. you you add in a couple others, and now all of a sudden half the league can challenge for Europe, and the quality there is unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, there's like you said, there's Arsenal, City, Liverpool. We'll say Chelsea, Spurs. If Kane stays, if yeah. Kane stays, Brighton. I wouldn't put Villa up there, but they're definitely interesting. United. Uh, United. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of, it's good. It's the best league in the world. You know, it's, it's like every game is competitive. And I also, mm-hmm. one other thing that I will bring up just cause I, I hate how American soccer works is promotion relegation makes that league so much better. Yeah. Like even on the last day of the season, there was, like you know three or four games where it's like these guys have to win or they're going down or like they're competing for a european spot like millions of dollars on the line like with the with the mls i feel like once it gets to the end of the season it's like you know there might be a few teams competing for a playoff spot but i don't know i just love promotion relegation yeah Um, i think it keeps it keeps it interesting yeah well it, it puts us well we saw um hashtag at tst and we were like we could be hashtag and start getting promoted our way up if it worked that way, but mm-hmm. it doesn't. So that kind of sucks. That's what Lucas was like. Yeah. Hashtag is us, but they can win their way up. He's like, yeah, yep. it sucks, but um, ha- they're doing some pretty cool things. And then Wrexham obviously got promoted into the fourth tier. So I think uh, Ben Foster resigned. So that'll be cool. I think, Bye. um, I don't think that they'll go up again, but I don't think they'll get relegated because their team is like half their team is like third division and fourth division players anyways. So I don't know. That'll be cool. The documentary was, was super good. Did you watch it? Welcome to Wrexham. I have not watched it. I need you to. Should. You should. It's really good. I uh, That's the thing with, with promotion relegation is like you can go 
up and down it can be you know it can be 10 years until you get to where you want to be or 20 years until you get to where you want to be but like the hope is always there you know yeah um, like like luton were in fifth tier nine years ago yeah exactly. and they've got they've got a player who was with them in the fifth tier who's still with them going into the premier league see those are the stories you love to hear yeah we just don't that. we just don't get that around around these parts top that's down. for sure that's for sure. And the buy-in to MLS is like bonkers. It's like whatever, yeah. hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars or something like that. You got um, it. Yeah. Any last, any last nickels? You want to plug the company and or anything else or? No. Yeah. I'll plug a company a bit. Um, if you're an entrepreneur listening to this or you're a business owner listening to this, what we do is we don't only have crypto products. We also have a normal kind of, software products that you can use but we help communities engage and um and activate their communities because that's the best way to get organic growth is, is word of mouth and if you have a good system to engage and incentivize your community what we do is is we help uh we help companies turn their communities into value creation machines so if you have a community surrounding your business whether you're a gym whether you're a, a restaurant whether you're any any business with a community around it, a software company, um, would love to chat. We got some tools that that we could chat about and some some tactics that that you could use potentially, um, whether it's in the web two or web three space. So Eric, I appreciate you having me on the pod. Um, and it, it's been a pleasure to chat and and ponder and and talk about the future with you, man. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate your time. You're a busy guy. Also, where can the people find uh, the company? Websites or yeah. Where should they go? You can go to uh, clarity.community um, is one of our domains. You can also go to clearcontracts.com. Um, and then we also have a Discord server where our community hangs out, chats and whatnot. Um, we have a weekly community call too that you can always welcome to hop on as well. It's on Fridays at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll send Eric you some links so you can get people plugged in. Yep, for sure. All those links will be in the description. Um, Logan, I appreciate your time. Great conversation as always. And yeah, with that, guys, we'll see you guys next time. Peace. Wrap. Right.